hear me? Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to start it out. Let me get this going. I want to start with this picture, which um, is a place I like to spend a lot of time in. It's a junkyard here in Madrid. It's on the outskirts, uh, very close to the airport, to Barajas Airport. And um, I do want to start with this image because I think it summarizes two things that are very present in my work. Uh, first of all, garbage, this excremental reality that we all participate in creating on a daily basis. It's what we don't like to see. And as an archeologist friend of mine once told me, you get to know a society by what they throw away. So I like to observe very carefully what we throw away as a way of understanding ourselves. And in particular, technological waste is something that's very present in my, in my process, in my creative process as an artist. But of course, we also have the airplanes that literally fly over your head. This is a, an Iberia 747, which actually became uh, garbage itself and landed, a lot of the parts landed in this junkyard. Uh, they don't fly anymore. Um, but I like to think of these airplanes as um, something that I'm also really fascinated with is something that takes us away from this other reality, this other reality of garbage, of what we throw away, what we don't want to see. And these two realities, the technological engineering miracle of modern commercial flight, which allows us to escape reality and go to faraway places, and this other reality are the two bipolar opposites, uh, that are very much part of my work. So I look at a lot of garbage, and I will be talking about garbage, and I will be talking about data. And I think they're kind of related, both of them. And I wanted to start out with this project. Uh, this is, um, this is a, actually a Photoshopped image of a project I wanted to do with DVDs. It's a little bit of an homage to the, to the format, to the media, which is dying or practically died. We live in a world now of data streaming online, of Netflix and all these other online services. And it occurred to me that uh, DVDs are kind of the end of a long chapter, a very long chapter of using material elements to store information. Um, from Gutenberg and the invention of the book, possibly to the DVD, now in the last few years, everything is online. And I'm really trying to understand this new uh, data reality, this algorithmic reality that has rendered all these other pre-existing technologies, material-based technologies, into garbage. So usually when I start a project, I create these images of what I want them to look like, which is the way I can get um, clients or uh, in this case, museums or art organizations to fund it. This is an expensive project. I wanted to have 2,400 movies in DVD format from all over the world. I wanted uh, to have uh, five projectors that are projecting synchronized onto the DVDs. Um, I wanted the cluster of DVDs to um, look like a cloud. Uh, a little bit of a pun of how all these films are now in the cloud. And so basically, um, the, I started, I started um, one of the rules uh, of, the, of the project was I had to get DVDs for free or in flea markets for one euro or one dollar or less. So here I'd like to introduce you to Felix. Felix was my DVD dealer in, in El Rastro here in Madrid. And he, he was the one that really started helping me get these kind of big amounts of DVDs. Um, and uh, as I say, one of the part of the rule was they couldn't be repeated. Um, it none of the DVDs could be repeated. Unfortunately, after a while, most of the films he was getting me were either Hollywood or Spanish films. So I was really, it was getting harder and harder to find uh, new films. I'd like to introduce you to another character that was very important in the whole process. This is Jose. And Jose had a video club in Alcobendas uh, in northern Madrid, and he had a big sign on the outside uh, saying DVDs for sale. And this was like, I'll never forget, it was like December 27th or 28th. It was like a chilly evening. I walked in, 
there was no heating in this video club and uh, he was all bundled up and, and I told him, you know, what you're selling DVDs, I'm interested to, to buy some. Uh, which, are you, which are you selling? And I I'll never forget this kind of gesture of kind of going like the entire store. And what happened is that after 20 something years, he was finally closing down his business because let's face it, people don't really rent DVDs anymore. And he actually told me that he was going to close the, uh, the shop three days later, December 31st, the last day of 2016. Uh, so basically, I could take the entire store if I wanted, which I did, uh, for, for one euro or less. Um, this is how I left his shop. There's a couple of films I didn't take because I already had them, but most, I just mostly took everything. But um, I wish I had taken the racks. That's one thing now I regret, not having taken the rack. But this was an historical moment for me. In fact, as I was emptying the shelves, uh, there were some clients uh, in their probably mid-60s, a couple that came in trying to rent a DVD. And I was just emptying the, 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 the racks, and they were, they were like, what's going on? You know, we want to see a film tonight. So it almost felt like this kind of historical moment. I have such fond memories myself, some of you probably do too, of going to the video club, you know, planning a weekend, renting two or three films. That's gone. That doesn't happen anymore. So I really, there was something sad about kind of emptying the shop and kind of seeing Jose's face as I was doing that. There was something kind of sad. I did give this material a new a new content, a new meaning. You will see shortly as an artwork. So then started the process of watching uh, all the films. Part of the project was I had to watch all the films, 2,400 films. About two months into the, f into the project, I was losing my mind. I was trying to watch seven to 10 films a day, but then I started fast forwarding them. Anyway, it was m my wife after a while was telling me I was getting very weird, that maybe I should rethink the project. In any case, um, I actually ended up getting some help to people that I hired, and I had all these categories of, of fragments that I was picking. This is a very fragmentary project. It's also a project about excess, about excess of films. But So as I was viewing all the films, we um, kind of did uh, my project manager, Diego Mellado, who's an engineer, he designed this whole kind of technological architecture to somewhat automate the process. So I would, I would find the time code of the film that I like, I would put it in an Excel sheet, and that was automatically, that little fragment was uh, uh, ripped and put into its corresponding uh, folder. Each folder was a different theme. It could be close-ups of faces, it could be horses, it could be doors, it could be close-ups of hands. I had up, up to 60 different categories. So um, as I finally finished, after many months of work, I finished viewing all these DVDs. I had a whole stack on the floor, and I immediately decided that this had to be part of the project. The actual plastic cases that are, you know, that are kind of um, protect the DVDs. There is something about it really looking like an archive, like a library. In fact, placed like this, they look like little books. So I ended up exhibiting this, this um, the actual DVDs that form uh, the collection of, of all the DVDs that are in the artwork. I put them on the outside of the exhibition space, which was in a museum in Pamplona. And so you could actually identify which were the films that formed the final project. Um, and also it really allowed me to uh, underscore this notion of the archive, of these material, physical ways we've had until very recently of storing information. And now, since then, since this has kind of disappeared, all hell has broken loose. And this is what I think we're still trying to figure out. It really happened in the last 10 years. We're still trying to figure out how, how that is, how that's affecting us. This is as we're installing the piece, uh, the 2,400 DVDs were video mapped. Um, again, there's five synchronized projectors, there's 12 audio tracks. I collaborated with a, a, a c composer, a Canadian composer, Alexander McSween. So there's 12 individualized soundtracks made with the soundtracks of the films 
that is a really kind of uh, experiential um, uh, piece that I'm just going to let you watch now without me talking over it. Uh, can we have some sound, please? For some reason, the sound is not working. So this, this uh, installation, as I was saying, is an homage to his dying uh, media, the DVD. Um, I identify more and more with these obsolete technologies, perhaps because I almost, I'm seeing myself reflected in them as myself, as a, as a human being, as a man, as an artist. Am I becoming obsolete as I'm getting older? These uh, technologies that have an expiration date suddenly feel... Uh, very human, and I want to give them a hug, and I want to say you were an amazing kind of engineering feat for your moment. So this has also very much made me think about uh, archives, and data are fundam fundamentally um, collections of libraries. And so I wanted to move on to this piece, which is a piece I did in a hotel in Munich. It's a permanent piece called Canula. And in the library of this hotel, um, uh, you can see how the bookcases, I inserted three screens that are kind of strategically placed in the space. And you see this very kind of liquid-like abstraction, uh, which is uh, not, you know, random, not totally abstract. It's actually based on YouTube videos. So there's an iPad that allows guests to introduce any search query they want, any, any the kind of things one would go to, to YouTube. And then the artwork will download 100 videos from that search, the first 100 videos that appear on YouTube. And then you also have the, op the, the option of being able to do a data reveal so you can see what those videos are that are forming, that are forming this default abstraction. YouTube perhaps being the ultimate library of the moment, then close to 5,000 million or 5 billion videos and growing every second that are part of YouTube. It's where we all go these days to try to understand, to try to, you know, how does this work? How many of this, how many, I mean, it's just like this default place that we go to uh, instead of going to the library, which is what we used to do before. So I really have been thinking a lot about um, how 
these kind of more liquid-like sources of information that are not solid, that are not material, that are ever-changing. Thinking very much also about this great book by Zygmunt Bauman, Liquid Modernity, which has had a big impact on my, on my life. How the liquid is this metaphor that explains the conditions of, of this ever-changing um, world we live in. I have this piece, it's called Ripple, and this piece is connected to uh, different news outlets. In this case, it was El País, uh, El País's webpage, the main newspaper here in Spain, but it, we have other versions where there's CNN and different news outlets. And the minute uh, this uh, webpage posts a video, that video gets downloaded into the artwork. And uh, it, it does this live, so it's a live feed. And as the video drops down the screen, it leaves this trail, this ripple, the ripple in itself having colors and forms that are based on the video that's generating it. So it's, I really think of it as a mural, as a, I really also like to kind of renovate the language of murals. It's a mural that's constantly and slowly changing. It's um, the news of the moment is covering the news that happened five, 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, which is very much about this kind of update anxiety that we constantly have of the new information, the latest and the newest. And more importantly also, I want it to be very textile-like look, looking. Like a textile, you get these kind of little threads of images, and I'm very interested in thinking about digital, digital imagery as a form of modern textiles. So this constant streaming of, of, of news is just one of many kinds of information, many different kinds of data that I am trying to somehow represent. I'm trying to give it a shape. I'm trying to give it a form. Here we have this piece called Ooze. Um, again, this very abstract lo looking uh, screen-based piece. The abstraction is actually based on financial data specifically on um, NASDAQ. So all, I'll let you read that. So all the logos from the different companies that form NASDAQ are in the artwork and they're r um, raising and dropping on the screen depending on their market value of the moment. So again, this is a piece that's live live formed in the moments in which the trading is happening. The default mode is the abstraction. It's this kind of liquid abstraction again. But the, um, the, uh, the, uh, it's actually formed, as I say, and it has a kind of the color palette, and the rhythm is determined by how the stock market is, is behaving at that moment. This piece was a program by Federico Guardabrazo, who's here in the public, who's being an amazing artist and collaborator and programmer that's helped me uh, uh, put a lot of this stuff up. So it's great to have you here, by the way. So financial data is, again, very much present um, in this kind of new world of data that we're thinking about. And then I have this series, which is called Echo. These are um, sculptural screens, LED screens, I found a fabricator that allowed me to create these screens that could be twisted and torqued. And they have all the exposed wiring. I love what is inside machines for me. It's usually much more interesting than what, what is the outside. So I wanted to leave all these entrails visible. And each one of these piece, pieces is connected to different kinds of web pages. For example, this one is connected to um, active fires around the globe. It's a web page that's thinking about deforestation. This piece, Troposphere, is um, reacting to the p pollution of the city of choice. The more orange, the more pollution, the bluer, the uh, cleaner the air. Up here we have magma, which is not even facing the screen. It's not even facing the public. It's a screen that's looking at the wall that is kind of painting the wall with these kind of swaths of different colors that are changing. This one is reacting to vo active volcanoes around the globe. 
the more um, when a when a volcano erupts, the animation gets um, accelerated. When the eruption um, ceases, it slows down. There's a little bit of a rebellion in these pieces, which are the, my favorite ones, are the ones that are not even looking at the public. Um, this one here is reacting to the wind speed and direction of the city of choice. So it's north, south, east, west. In this case, it would be like a gentle westerly breeze. The, the screen itself looks like it's kind of being folded by, by a gust of wind. And then we have latitude which projects to the ceiling and the floor. Towards the ceiling is changing temperatures of Kuwait, the hottest city in the world. On the upper, the upper screen is changing temperatures uh, of the coldest city in the world in Siberia. And for me, the artwork is also very much about what happens on the surrounding walls. So one of the things I really wanted to stress um, about this series, Echo, is my resistance to doing work that's about data visualization. Uh, all these works are reacting to data. Um, and that's for me, is important. We talk about the internet of things, where our cars and our refrigerators and maybe soon our toasters are connected to the internet. However, I'm a little bit frustrated as an artist in seeing other artists working with data visualization. There's something kind of enslaving to the information. And as an artist, I don't want to have this instrument, this tool to uh, represent information, which is very valid. I think sometimes we do need new ways to represent data. But as an artist, I really don't want to be, as I say, kind of a slave of that kind of educational um, aspect of, of, of data. I just want to use it. I want to really give a very kind of sensual, sensorial experience of data to know that these glowing pieces that look, I think of them almost as creatures, are sensing their environment, not their immediate environment in the room, but perhaps, uh, you know, an earthquake that's happening, you know, in the depths of the Pacific, or a fire that's happening in the Amazons across the ocean, or, uh, you know, the pollution in, in the faraway city. So this for me is really my kind of my artistic license, which is uh, really how I'm able to approach uh, data and try to really process it in a very kind of um, personal way. I wanted to also show you this show, which is really a good narrative of the change, starting with a small cluster of Ethernet cables, of Cat5 cables, with a projector that projects a very simple video animation thinking about data transmission through something as material as wires, cables. As we move out of a, you know, we're going, we're going towards the wireless world, uh, cables themselves can become obsolete. I also was able to bring this as a show I had here in Madrid in Sala Alcala 31. I had it over last winter. Maybe some of you had the chance of seeing it. I was able to, to bring to Madrid um, the DVD piece, which is called Sica. Sika and Hentium, which was very cool to be able to see it in the space because you had the upper terraces to look down. So you could be part of the work, you were in the work, and you could see it from the outside. I didn't explain, of course, the reflections are the reflections of the movies that bounce off the DVDs and um, kind of project not only onto the walls, but onto the public also. So the public kind of becomes a screen for all these memories. Here we have the archive, the library. We're saying goodbye to these material libraries to give way to the YouTube piece where the uh, uh, computer would randomly find a word, uh, go on YouTube, download 100 videos, and you really never knew what you would get. this kind of impossible liquid archive of data that is never settles, is always changing, is always moving, is always growing. Um, my echo series, including this one, which is reacting to rainfall, the average rainfall of 100 different cities in the world. The more rainfall, the more active the, anima the abstract animation becomes. But these pieces are very much also about how they engage the, the exhibition space how they kind of 
think of them as very much like a James Turrell, the light artist, and how they kind of illuminate and, and paint uh, the, uh, the exhibition space. Thinking also about screens and this kind of liquid world, the screens themselves start to melt. The screens themselves are not these rigid, flat surfaces. Uh, they're also kind of overextended. Uh, draft is another recent series I was able to present. Uh, texts that are part of foundational texts of our democratic system are distorted by the wind of the city where they were written. For example, in the background there we're seeing the Declaration of Human Rights, which is, has all the words that are being distorted by the winds of the city in Paris, uh, the Magna Carta, and Runnymede in the UK, or the US Constitution, all the words of the US Constitution are distorted by the wind in real time of the city of Philadelphia, where it was. This is another financial data piece, Asylum. And it's interesting that people really kind of want to immerse themselves in the data, almost like a bathing of data. Uh, it's reacting to 393 global index funds. If their value drops in the market, the ticker symbol drops, or if it raises, it also goes up. And all this world of data is leaving these ruins behind. And I'm very interested in these ruins. All these, um, this is a series called Small Data. All these obsolete technologies, from broken circuit boards, to remote controls, to DVDs, VHS players, Game Boys from the 80s. They're all kind of left in the wake of this surge, this unstoppable surge of, of data, of this algorithmic reality we live in. This is what they leave these ruins behind them. And I kind of pull them out of the garbage and I try to give them a new life, a new opportunity. And then I like to, I wanted to end up with this piece, which is called Plexus. This is my hand. Uh, repeated with these kind of synchronized kind of choreography, um, really trying to understand what it means as an artist to leave your mark on an artwork. So a painter paints a canvas with his paint or her paint, and there's a very direct marking that they leave on their body. What, what kind of marking do I leave as an artist that works you know, with computers and algorithms, with engineers and programmers. Where am I in all this equation? That's one thing, it's a little bit of a thing that I wanted to explore. I also wanted to show you some, um, some larger commissions that I'm doing, and it's kind of interesting to take a lot of the things that I'm exploring into the public space realm, permanent artworks. Uh, this is a continuous screen Again, really taking advantage of this of these flexible screens. But as an artist, I love to play, and that's one of the main things that artists need to play, be playful with the materials. Why do screens always have to be flat and rectangular? Why can they not have this kind of three-dimensionality that allows them to engage the architecture in a way that is much more engaging than a flat screen? The screens themselves are very catered to the space that contains them. They act a little bit like lights, like lamps that illuminate the space. The content um, is usually based, for example, this is a, I created this abstract animation based on uh, a recording that I did with all the employees of the building. And this kind of liquid modernity that we're talking about, I feel like these screens themselves are melting are dissolving, are becoming almost like a skin that melts. And I'm very interested in kind of thinking in a very kind of um, physical way. And what does it mean to have these physical three-dimensional screens? What can I do with them? And how, how do they change our way of, not only of looking at moving images, but of editing and creating content for these artworks. This was the first one I did in 2010 in Brussels in the European Union Council, where I had all these Europeans dragging themselves along the screen, a little bit of a uh, 
uh, ironic gesture. This is um, a piece that's a permanent installation in an airport in Tampa in Florida. The screens here are coiling around the, uh, the truss system of the terminal. And I wanted uh, to have this kind of, almost like this artwork is clinging onto a pre-existing uh, uh, architecture. And what you see on the screens are animations that are based on South Florida um, plants, uh, mostly vines, uh, a lot of different kinds of vines, but also other kinds of plants. I work with the, with the Tampa Botanical Gardens to really get a sense of the different um, plants that are part of the locality. And so there is an, a computer that is algorithmically deciding how many flowers or leaves do these plants have, how fast or slow do they grow, um, and what combination do they appear. And for me, I really think of myself as almost like a gardener with this piece because through Team Viewer, we're connected to it from my studio here in Madrid. And the idea is that I keep on introducing new plants into the artwork, will continue to do so. So I'm kind of cultivating long distance through the, through the internet, uh, this garden on the other side of the ocean. I'm also really beginning to understand that uh, this kind of algorithmic behavior is very similar to the kind of combinatorial elements that we find in, na in living systems, in nature and plants. So in a way, technology in this kind of stage we're in is entering this kind of nature 2.0 phase. There's a real um, interesting kind of coincidences in how we program and how nature grows and how it combines different elements to have this kind of huge amount of, of uh, uh, possible combinations. Anyway, also it's very exciting. There's an average of 15,000 people walk under this piece every day. So it's a very broad audience, passengers. It was also um, probably an unforgettable experience to spend 14 days working in an airport. I'd like to remind you the first picture I showed you how fascinated I am about airplanes and technology. So yes, there is garbage, but there's also airplanes that are somehow also seeping into my, into my work. And I know all about how airports work and that was a really fascinating experience. It's one of the lucky things about doing all these projects, I get to learn about all these different worlds. Um, this is a piece that I just opened, uh, just uh, unveiled a couple weeks ago. Um, it's in an engineering school in Texas, in College Station, Texas, about an hour north of Houston. Um, in this case, these are again these flexible screens that come in and out of, uh, of this uh, uh, kind of lobby space. And there's five screens. I, I wanted to make it look like a snake that uh, uh, disappears and reemerges down through the hallway. And what you're seeing on the, um, on the actual screens is an abstraction, an abstraction again programmed by Federico Guardabrazo, again here in the audience. And this abstraction is pulling from data that's related to the, to the building. So um, it's basically reacting to internet use in the moment, electric, um, water, and air conditioning. So what is interesting is that the people that are in the building itself, in other words, the um, students, for example, that are in the, in the space, in the unit, they're actually part of the work. Whether they know it or not, they're part of the work just by being online by using electricity, by plugging in their laptops. And again, you get these spikes of, of, of kind of uh, activity in the mornings, which are the busiest hours. As the evening hours come in, the animation just becomes a lot more gentle. So it's almost thinking of the building as this kind of living system that self-regulates itself. And I really wanted to expose the inner wiring to the, 
uh, infrastructures of these buildings and expose them to, to the general public because most of this is invisible. And that's, again, that's one of the interesting things about data, it's kind of invisible. I mean, we don't have like a real concrete physical manifestation of what data is about. And as an artist, I think that's what we like to do the best, is kind of point out to things that are kind of invisible and um, make them more present to the general public. And finally, I wanted to end up with this piece, uh, Rafagas, uh, which is kind of a more of an environmental context. Uh, these are four screens, and each text shows the words of different environmental uh, treaties. So we have the, the Rio de Janeiro uh, um, Convention, we have the Paris Agreement, we have the Kyoto Protocol and the Montreal Protocol. So I've introduced all the words um, in each one of the screens is showing all those words being distorted by the um, wind of the city where those texts were written in real time. So it, you know, it could be a south wind, a west, whatever. Whatever wind is happening, Montreal, Kyoto, Rio, and um, which am I forgetting? And Montreal. That's what, what it appears on the screen. You can kind of see the screens, the words. Um, I really wanted to create an animation that was kind of on the threshold between being legible and being completely abstract. I think we live in a time where the written word is losing its um, authority. Um, the authority of the law is always being thought of as something that's written, a written statement. But there's also this sense of uh, entering this kind of new visual media that's constantly changing, that never settles, and also a very direct reference to the political winds of the moment, the rise of populisms of Donald Trump and of other populist movements in Europe that are distorting these texts that are so uh, kind of fundamental for our survival as a species. Um, so again, um, I find as an artist that uh, Data is something that I'm really um, interested in using artistically. I'm also seeing there's a lot of dangers in how we use data in our world. Um, we could maybe talk about there, maybe there's some more questions. In any case, what I do think it's important is that we're able to kind of um, incorporate data into our lives in a very kind of um, physical, I would even say, not only just this kind of conceptual way, but in a very physical way, in a very sensorial way, really make it part of our lives uh, as something that's, while it's inevitably there, it's kind of hidden, but this is our new reality we're entering. And as an artist, I have the privilege of having the tool of contemporary art to be able to really place myself, put myself in these worlds to try to see and understand how, how, I, how, I, um, how I feel about them and how I negotiate them and how I think they could be kind of created and used in the future. So um, that's it, thank you very much. I was asked to speak for 40 minutes. It's 38 minutes and 30 seconds. I guess that uh, now, now it's actually your time to, to the Q&A. And I think in the Q&A, it's actually the opportunity to, to ask what you want and hear about the project that you want. And we have this nice speaker that you just say, I have a question, and I throw it to you. And then you just ask. So we need the first one to actually be brave to ask the question. Do we have one? OK, I see it at the back. Do you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Ready? <laughs> Hello. Oh, wow. Um, thanks a lot for that. I have a pretty specific question, and I'm interested in, uh, a legal, uh, I guess, a legal um, aspect of your work. I see you use a lot of logos, a lot of manufactured products. 
the films um, were the ones that really got me thinking about it. What kind of, if any, copyright issues do you run into? And how do you navigate that aspect of your work? Um, well, regarding the film piece, uh, the DVD piece, where I use thousands and thousands of clips, there's an artistic um, license that basically if you use under a certain amount of seconds, uh, that's allowed. Those seconds change from country to country and from continent to continent. But I'm pretty much within the safe zone. I usually get like four or five second clips from each film. So that I've kind of, you know, uh, sure secreted that issue. In terms of using logos, for example, of NASDAQ, of course, this is the default mode is this kind of liquid abstraction. And one could theoretically say when you do the data reveal and you actually see the logos that I'm kind of infringing copyright issues. I still have not heard from Facebook or Tesla or um, but it's again because it's kind of I'm hoping because this is not like this kind of stable use of, of, of these legals. It's all very kind of you know unbalanced and changing and it's you never know what logos would be. It would be kind of hard for them to pin me down but you never know. I mean uh, I think it, we're entering a lot of new kind of legal um, question marks as we're entering this new kind of algorithmic reality uh, where it's not as, you know, we don't have that kind of equal sense of copy pasting anymore. It's more like copying and distorting and morphing and changing into something completely different. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of question marks about the legality of all this. I'm still am always fearful of that phone call, but so far so good. Thanks. More questions? You can throw it between you. Let's play away. Hi. Hi. Congratulations on, on your work. I find it really uh, inspiring and, and intriguing. Thank you. And one thing that intrigues me, it's, um, for example, in that, in that uh, project you showed in Texas, why do you think they hire you? What kind of return do your clients get from this uh, approach of, of art? Well, it probably would be a good question to ask them. I don't really know, but I can, I can maybe... That's why I said, why do you think? Why do I think? Uh, in specifically the one in Texas, the, uh, the one that the, the kind of pulls from the data from the building, this is an engineering uh, school. So, and it's a very well-known engineering school, A&M University. Um, it's kind of known as one of the main uh, engineering universities. So, the art consultant, and this, I was approached by an art consultant who was finding artworks to put in all over the building, um, 10 different art pieces uh, that had some kind of um, relationship with engineering, with technology, with science. Um, from many different approaches. So um, it was very important for them to, to kind of engage the students from, through art. Uh, and this is, this is unfortunately something that I find that still today there's just not enough communication between engineers and artists. I mean, I'm very grateful that I have an engineer that works in my studio, has almost for 10 years now. But in general, they're kind of seen as very separate realms. And it was a great opportunity for me to to kind of be able to create an artwork in this context that, in fact, I went to um, talk to a lot of students during the, during the process, and it was really interesting to see how they were looking at the work. It was very different to what I had imagined. Uh, another space, like an airport, I think we're seeing more and more spaces uh, of public use that incorporate art. Uh, airports are definitely becoming really important because Airports are now competing with each other as being like the most comfortable, most beautiful, and the most, the best food. I mean, there's like a real competition now to, to, for airports to kind of um, be used as hubs to fly in and out of. So artwork is becoming something they're using more and more to kind of make these experiences, these non-spaces more kind of more appealing and, and you know, just a more uh, interesting experience for, for travelers. One of the things that I'm discovering as an artist who is very immersed in the kind of the art world, the official art market, because I have galleries, I make artwork that sells in galleries and 
had exhibitions in museums and et cetera, et cetera, is that the art world is still extremely reluctant to show media art. Um, they're very concerned about how it breaks and how the maintenance and what happens in 10 and 15, 20 years. Never mind that most paintings need to be restored every few years. They don't care to hear about that. But when it comes to meteor art, they're almost like allergic. And I really, quite honestly, am not seeing any advances in that respect. On the other hand, I'm seeing more and more clients, uh, companies, organizations, airports, train stations, you name it, uh, that are totally not, um, shall we say, nervous about introducing media-based art, probably because there's so much media already present in these buildings. There's so many screens, there's so much technology, and they have maintenance crews. So it's like a very natural thing for them to incorporate this kind of work into their spaces. So I'm actually finding that a real, um, just even for my survival as an artist, to keep my doors open as an artist, which is not an easy thing to do, uh, I'm finding a you know, like a real um, way of being able to make these projects. Um, and, you know, right now I have five large-scale commissions on the go, so it's definitely surprising how, in theory, how the art world is kind of thought of as like this crazy experimental sp space. I'm actually finding that crazy experimental space is ironically happening in a more corporate setting than one would imagine. Super interesting. More questions? I see over here one hand. There's one back there. And, and then oh, yeah. I'll let you throw it all the way up. Okay, so have you done any projects with health data? Um, because I mean, it's kind of becoming a, a big space is using, getting massive amounts of health data and then opening it up. Health data? Yeah. Oh, well, it's interesting you ask that. Um, I have this project that's kind of, let's just say it's stalled somewhat. Um, but I'm hoping it will eventually, uh, there's these projects that kind of come and go. I was asked by a bioinformatics department of a university, uh, UTSW, <laughs> University of Texas Southwest. They have this, probably the most important uh, medical data center in the world where they're, they're just doing these crazy projects like trying to cure cancer and things like that. Like they're really serious about it through, uh, data crunching. And they asked me to do an artwork, ironically, kind of connecting with my, with my kind of a whole speech about the disappearance of, you know, DVDs and books. And uh, they had a big uh, library in this building with books that people stopped visiting. So they basically, they digitized all the books, they got rid of all the books, or they, I guess they stored them, they didn't really burn them or anything, but they put them away. And then they've asked me to do an artwork for this space using this kind of health, healthcare data. So I'm hoping that maybe in a few months I can, this will uh, pick up right now. It's kind of a, a project that's, the proposal is being made and um, definitely the amount of data that's generated around our, our human bodies and medical issues is phenomenal. That's kind of one of the more positive uh, uses of big data, I think, definitely, are, uh, for, for health reasons. You need two hands. <laughs> I was about to stall. <laughs> I wasn't looking. Okay. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I understood, can you hear it now? You're more inspired by like quant quantity and like data in that sense. But do you think, for example, in the future, you would be interested in like representing information that is a bit more abstract, like not so like measurable in, you know, like data sense, numerical sense? Well, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by abstract data because usually data is not really abstract, it's usually quite specific. But like, like, I don't know, like feelings or more like human behavior. Uh-huh, like emotional kind of readings of the body and that kind of stuff. Perhaps, but I, maybe I'm not gonna answer your question exactly, but I do wanna talk about abstraction because I think that word is one that's very present in my mind right now. 
and I've never thought of myself as an abstract artist, but I am. I am becoming an abstract artist. I have become an abstract artist. Um, we live in a world of so much information. There's this huge kind of, you know, endless amounts of videos and photographs and text about almost anything you can think of. It just seems like almost crazy and ridiculous and like just why do another picture, or another create another video, or another article, or another trying to explain our world? It seems like just there's so much out there. As an artist, I feel like I don't really have too much I can contribute. So what is interesting for me is that I'm discovering that abstraction and all my work recently was very abstract allows me to capture the spirit of, the, of these kind of realities, these data realities. Uh, the, the pulse, it's almost like taking the pulse of something. Because, you know, if we want to try to understand, you know, deforestation through the amount of fires that are happening or how many square meters, how do we represent that? We can just use numbers, yes, it's like, you know, right now there's 3,500 active fires in the planet. We can have a picture of a forest up in flames. We could have a video. Of, but for me, it doesn't really cut it anymore. I think we need to find other ways of connecting with that information and connecting with it in a more kind of emotional way, in a more sensual way that almost feels, you can feel it all. I'm hoping, I'm trying to be able to connect with it more. So, um, so abstraction um, allows me to do that because all again, all these worlds, all these data, data fees are you know in the end it's all very abstract. And um, whether I'd be interested in doing these kind of emotional states, for sure, for sure. I'm working on a meditation piece now. Actually, um, I can't really tell you about it because we're just starting it, but. It's, uh, I'm, I just started doing transcendental meditation uh, a few months ago. It's like, poof, just changed my life. <laughs> you should go out and do it. It's amazing. And so I'm very interested in these kind of more, uh, you know, brain waves and emotional states. It'd be very cool to explore that more. More questions? Okay. Ready? Hi. Um, so my question is in relation to the reliability of the data that you choose. Do you have any considerations to the biases that can come from the person taking the data or, or just the way that you pose the question to get that data? Um, it's usually um, very kind of straightforward web pages, uh, meteorological web pages. Um, Sure, they could they could uh, manipulate or, or not even even manipulate. They could uh, not track these this data feeds correctly, or they could be um, maybe they weren't you know they're not really live when they say they do. They are live. Um, in general, I have to I have to kind of trust it. However, I guess for me there is imp an important sense that this is live. That this is actually happening in the moment. Because but because I'm not doing actual data visualization. Perhaps that kind of urgency of the reliability of the data is not such a massive, important issue. It is art after the world. I'm not trying to, you know, keep airplanes from crashing or something, you know. So, but um, but it's a good question. You know, one wonders the how you know how real this information that we kind of take is. You know, I mean, if you if you talk about financial data, I think. The atmosphere is critical and, and its reliability. It has to be critical because, you know, so much is running on these numbers. You know, fortunes are made in seconds or lost. Fortunes are lost in seconds. So there has to be a certain accountability uh, for that. One of the questions also that's interesting is how is all this data um, collected, you know? Um, who collects it? For what purposes? What are the biases around you know, those organizations that are collecting this information. If it's a person, because no, no, it's not usually even a person anymore, it's more like an organization or who, who programs, who does the programming for this data. I mean, it's just it's such a m massively fascinating and new world. I mean. Hey, 
Um, I was wondering, uh, like... I can't see you. Can you wave your hand? Where are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I was wondering, because I've always thought about this, like, um, related to artists. Have you ever thought of, like, I suppose that your intention when you do, like, an art piece is that they know the context and they know, like, what the art piece is doing. Like, for example, the, um, that y one of the pieces is representing the uh, data for the wind or the rain or the forests. Have you ever thought about, like, what if they look at the piece and they don't know that? Like, do you think that has a different meaning? If they don't have the context of what it's representing or, like? Well, um, yes, that became a little bit of an issue the first time I presented the Echo series, these sculptural screens that are following you know, rainfall and earthquakes and all that, that whole series, is that initially um, th that information of what data they were reacting to was like in the entrance of the gallery. So nobody usually looks at the information in the entrance. They just walk in, they see the show, and they were just seeing as these kind of pretty objects that illuminate the space and that they were kind of interesting from a sculptural point of view. And I think for me, that kind of bonus element of finding out that, yes, these are interesting objects on a wall or on the floor, but then when they find out that there's that extra element that they're live, that they're connected to the internet, so it's like, it completely changes the reading. Mm -hmm. So I started making that information a lot more accessible, a lot more um, kind of present. Art, in general, it's very contextual. The more context you have, the more information you have about the work and how it was generated, how it was created, the intentionalities of the artist, usually the richer the experience is. Um, so I'm, I'm mentioning this because sometimes it's good to make the public work a little harder. And those that do make that extra effort suddenly discover something about the work that most people wouldn't know. And that totally like excites people when they discover that kind of less obvious um, element of the work, that can be very exciting. So one has to find a balance. You don't want to be too obvious. You don't want to spoon feed the meaning of the work. Um, you don't want to be too cryptic or people just won't get it at all. You have to find this kind of nice balance where what, as they find out about more about the work, more context about the work, they kind of get sucked into it. Art for me is ultimately a medium. And as a medium, it mediates between people. So very often it's maybe not so much about the work itself. It's about using the work to communicate, to connect people. And the way we are connecting right now through my work, even though it's not physically present, but we're talking about certain issues through my work. For me, that's the magic of art. And that's why it is so important for me to connect with, with the audience, with the public. I really think a lot about that. I'm not interested um, in having art that is so inaccessible that unless you read five volumes, you will not really understand it. I think it's okay that there are artists that I do that, but my approach is, in general, my work is quite accessible. And if you just scratch a little bit over the surface or you go and read the label, that information is there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, question is over here. Someone? Okay. Hi. Uh, I want to know a little bit more about your creative process. Uh, like, if you have any aha moments, or do you plan with a lot of advance, you know? Like, when you get this idea and you say, this is my next project, uh, or I'm going to do this because whatever the reason. Um, uh, yeah, my art process, um, it's a very kind of, making art is not easy. Um, I've been to a few conferences that speak about the creative process, and I usually nearly explode when I hear like people talk about how wonderful the creative process is, how it makes you feel good, and how it stimulates the endorphins. And, and anybody that really has taken the, you know, has seriously engage with creative issues knows how frustrating it is. Wonderful when things go along, but when you keep on, when you get stuck, when you, 
you know, when you face that blank page and a day in and day out and nothing, and then you do these prototypes and they're like terrible, it's really, that's really tough. And that's when, when you have to keep on going. Um, I do a lot of projects that are awful. Uh, and I think you have to do a lot of very bad work, a lot of shitty work to be able to be able to pull out other pieces that are good. So my process is very trial and error. Um, it's very trusting of the process itself. And what I mean by this is that every project, whether it's an art project or anything else, it starts with the most humbling origins. It could be a sentence on a napkin. It could be something you just quickly draw in your little notebook as you're riding the subway. It could be just, you know, something like some toothpicks that you arrange into to this formation. That is the origin of so many ideas. And it's really hard to believe in them when they're just so nothing. Yet I've been working long enough now to trust those very humble beginnings and feed them and nurture them and water them as if they were plants and then they slowly start growing. And oh look, it looks like there's something here. Oh, this part doesn't work. I'm gonna put this aside and, and, and maybe. Um, it's also another very difficult part of about the art process is to be able to see the work in a way that's kind of clean. Because let's face it, 99.9% of the population has terrible self-esteem problems, including myself. I have terrible self. Now that I'm doing meditation, I'm getting better. But um, we basically have a very hard time looking at our work. And the first thing we say is, this is a piece of shit. I hate it. And you have to learn to have that kind of distance. Like, come on, relax. Get your ego out of the way. Get your insecurities out of the way. Just look at the work. What is working here? What isn't? Very often, it's so hard for us to do that that we need to find, shall we say, accomplices, people that can come in that we trust. And what do you think? People that we really trust. They have to really know our work, you know? I'm lucky to have a team that I work with, and I'm very trusting of... Uh, I always make the final decision, but I'm very trusting of my team. I want to hear uh, their opinions. I mean, th the process is really the most interesting thing. It's also the most torturous thing, but it's extremely interesting, and you never have figured it out. You know, I think I have all these tricks to kind of move pieces along, and then when you start working on a new project, it's almost like starting over again. It's like, no, I'll have this trick and that trick, and I... You know, sometimes I read and that inspires me, and sometimes on an airplane I take the entire flight just thinking about your idea. But there's always, like, you have to find a new approach. And I think also that kind of keeps you young in a way. Uh, it keeps you guessing. It keeps you, nev you don't never really know what, what's going to come up. But um, at the same time, my process is I'm very structured in my day. I have a very specific routine. I have a very specific time where I'm alone in the studio in the mornings before the team comes in. It's a very precious time where I write in my art journal, where I kind of look through projects that are kind of in process, where I'm able to ask myself questions. I have a series of questions that I ask myself on a daily basis that help me kind of figure out what the next steps are. Prototypes are huge. But also, one project builds on another. Every, everything in the end is a long string of, of one idea or two ideas that we explore in different ways. We each have our own individual, shall we say, our, our you know, connecting thread, our, uh, our, th our themes that reemerge in different ways. And in the end, it's all one long series that we develop through our lifetime. Um, and the process, that process is a process of a, of a lifetime too. But I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain. I don't know if that was helpful. But uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what I got is that you have some kind of routine and, yes. and discipline and that helps you uh, to develop ideas. Yes. Yeah. I very much have a routine. It's a routine that I've kind of developed through the years. Um, one of the hardest things, I mean, for me, art is basically about paying attention. 
And when you have this kind of altered sense of attentiveness, you start noticing these small details around you that were there, but somehow nobody had noticed them. It's really, art is really about pointing and saying, look at this, look at that, look at this data, look at that data, look at what this data is doing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, it's really hard these days to pay attention. And to pay attention is the origin of all great ideas whether they're art or any kind of a creator. And we live in a world that is bombarding us constantly with information. We were so perpetually distracted by Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we walk around our lives thinking, oh, I have to go pick up, I have to go to the pharmacy, then go to the market, and so-and-so said that, they're idiots. And we have this kind of inner monologue that's really kind of draining. So for me, the hardest part is to create this kind of parenthesis in my day to block out some time of paying attention, just thinking, looking, feeling, not getting distracted. And whenever I do that, something happens. And sometimes it's really hard because my days are very busy. I have a lot of projects on the go. Uh, but whenever I have that kind of moment, even if it's an hour or two in a day where I just kind of have that s kind of altered sense of paying attention, that's a huge, very important element of the process of beginning new projects. So I really try to remember that. I have to remember that. I need to find that empty space, that quiet time um, to really uh, be able to kind of sort my ideas, my thoughts. Anyway. That's a okay. great takeaway. Thank you. Yeah. Daniel, first of all, thank you very much. You're I, welcome. I feel that we are lucky as human beings to be surrounded by art and artists. Um, first of all, thank you, I mean, for pushing us, doing those events without this wonderful community. We would have done those uh, events in the past and in the future. Uh, in a second, I will put again the links if you want to hear more about uh, events that we are going uh, to do in the, in the near future. We will have another event on visualization another super interesting artist uh, in November, so stay tuned. We have some beers um, uh, at the back. Um, one thing, we cannot leave the space with the drinks, and please pay attention to, to your stuff. Daniel, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank guys. you for coming, everybody.